The Russian Area Studies Program has been holding this Russia Now event for decades, and we are not about to let a little pandemic stop us now. I'm Adam Weiner, Chair of Russian, and the moderator for tonight's discussion. You are going to hear three distinguished speakers tonight, and after they've all spoken, we can attempt a question and answer session when they've all finished. Um, the third talk is done. We'll start that up. At that time, please use the Zoom chat feature to send your questions directly to me, and I will choose questions to ask of our presenters. So the first of our three speakers tonight is Professor Nina Tumarkin. Professor Tumarkin is Catherine Wasserman Davis, Professor of Slavic Studies, Professor of History, and Director of the Russian Area Studies Program at Wellesley College, where she teaches courses on medieval, imperial, and Soviet Russia, as well as seminars on World War II and on Vladimir Putin. She's also a longtime associate of Harvard University's Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies. Professor Tumarkin has a longstanding interest in the political uses of history, and her current book project explores the politics of the past in Putin's Russia, focusing on the historical memory of World War II. Her past career has included the role of advisor to President Reagan, for whom she wrote two invited papers and served as one of six Soviet experts who briefed the president, vice president, and key cabinet members shortly before Mr. Reagan's first meeting with Mikhail Gorbachev at the 1985 Geneva summit. In preparation for his Victory Day visit to Moscow in 1995, President Bill Clinton read Professor Tamarkin's book, The Living and the Dead, The Rise and Fall of the Cult of World War II in Russia. Professor Tumarkin is also the author of Lenin Lives, The Lenin Cult in Soviet Russia. Uh, Professor Tamarkin, or Nina as we know her, uh, will talk about the pandemic tonight, um, Victory Day, the Khabarovsk protests, and uh, Mr. Navalny, of course. Our second speaker of the night will be Professor Tom Hodge. Professor Hodge has devoted most of his research to Russian literature and Russian music in the 1800s and to the history of 19th century Russia, nature writing and hunting literature. Professors, Professor Hodge's latest book is called Hunting Nature, Ivan Turgenev in the Organic World. And it is hot off the Cornell University Press right now, this month of September. Um, I will try to show or share um, a photograph of the book cover later on tonight. But for now, I just want to say how proud we are of our colleague and uh, how happy we are we, that he got such a great book finished and placed at a wonderful press like Cornell. Um, Turgenev is traditionally identified as a chronicler of Russia's ideological struggles, but Professor Hodge in his book rehabilitates him as an expert naturalist whose intimate knowledge of flora and fauna deeply informed his view of philosophy, politics, and the role of literature in society. Um, Professor Hodge argues in the book that we stand to learn a great deal about Turgenev's thought and literary technique when we read him in both cultural and environmental contexts. Tom's topic tonight is Climate Change in Russia, Siberian Environmental Disasters 2020. Our third and last speaker tonight will be Dr. Christiana Botticello. Christiana studies ethnics, ethnic politics, national integration policy, political support, and politics in the former Soviet region. She's writing her dissertation, Mixed Strategies of Nation Building in Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia at Brandeis University, and is working on a project comparing correlates of support for independence in Catalonia, Quebec, Scotland, and Flanders with Professor Stephen Elberg. We are lucky to have Christiana teaching political science at Wellesley College a little bit later this year. This evening, Christiana's topic is going to be Belarus and its impact on Russia. She will also be discussing the spring 2020 constitutional reforms. So with that said, we can start with Professor Tumarkin. And again, please hold your questions 
until the very end and submit them in writing on the chat. Nina, it's, it's all you. Ah, okay. I'm now unmuted and delighted that so many of you have joined this uh, this evening. Um, this annual faculty panel is always held in September and historically it has frequently followed some dramatic event that has occurred in Russia in August. There have been many dramatic events, the collapse of the ruble in 1988, the, uh, the sinking of the Kursk uh, nuclear submarine in 2000. Most memorable, I think, was 2008 in the aftermath of the war between Russia and Georgia when we had to move this event, which historically has always been in the library lecture room, to the atrium to accommodate 250 or more people. Uh, and true to form, August 2020 did indeed see a dramatic and most appalling event of which about which I expect most of you have read and which I will address, however, briefly later in this presentation, the poisoning of Alexei Navalny, Russia's most prominent um, opposition figure. So we call this panel Russia Now. Russia Now. How fares today our geopolitical adversary? Now I use that term advisedly. My uh, late dissertation advisor, Richard Pipes, who was in the National Security Council in the Reagan administration, once at a meeting at the Pentagon, referred to the USSR as our rival. And a general in the Pentagon corrected him and said, the USSR is not our rival. The USSR is our adversary. Our rival is the Navy. Well, now and in recent months, Russia has been faced with some of the same challenges as the United States. The pandemic, calamitous heat, wildfires, and related environmental disasters connected with climate change, popular protests in the streets, the lowered approval rating of the country's president, and yet the actual differences uh, between our two countries I think decidedly outweigh the similarities. Perhaps the most striking is that while the United States palpably seethes with tumult, volatil volatil volatility, social tensions between left and right, almost reminiscent of, say, France in the 1930s, and a feeling that nothing is normal anymore, Russia appears to be far more stable with life going on more or less as usual. There was a dramatic indication of this just two weeks ago on September 1st, when throughout Russia, which is the fourth in the world, has the, is the fourth in the world's number of COVID-19 cases, nonetheless, throughout Russia, children return to school. And I'd like to show some photographs of that return to school. So um, here we have the classic little girl in her organza bows. This could have been taken in 1950, but it was taken two weeks ago. And was, we moved down to just look at some of the photographs and see how the children looked. It's traditional for them to be bringing flowers to their teachers and to dress up, especially on the first day of school. Um, it all looks so organized and it looks so respectful. Uh, here are some young cadets. Yes, somebody getting a temperature checked, but there's flowers for, for the teacher that's, that's going to get brought in. Um, uh, and the, the kids looks like maybe second grade, something like that. Um, and on each desk, there are flowers that, gonna be, that are going to be given to the teacher. Um, here is the board, the board boy. Here are the board boys yawning. Um, all dressed up by their parents, and my favorite, I think, the little first graders um, who are um, well-dressed, neat, uh, they're not socially distanced, they're not in masks, life as usual. Thank you very much um, for showing those photographs for me. Um, and um, 
So, but let's take a look at the pandemic. Now, um, with all this going on, everybody, the children are in school, Russia reports uh, over 1 million cases. And I just said the fourth most in the world, actually after the US, India, and Brazil, there's a suspiciously low death count. Um, if the reported figures um, are indeed correct or only somewhat exaggerated, um, it, it must be noted that Russia has fewer very old people than does the United States with an average life expectancy higher than it's ever been of 73, um, as opposed to the US where it's 79. Male life expectancy is as high as it's ever been, a little over 67. Um, in 1990, it was down to 58. So all these numbers have been going up, but there really are fewer very old people. And also in the United States, um, sadly, over 40% of US COVID deaths are linked to nursing homes and other long-term care facilities. In Russia, it's far more common for old people to remain at home, looked after by home health aides, who are often brought in from the former, the poorer former Soviet republics. In Moscow, for example, they often come from, from Ukraine. Um, and uh, of course, the, the country was hard hit by the pandemic with its vast size ranging across 11 time zones. The incidents varied widely. Russia's cases pe peaked on around May 9th, the very day it was to have engaged in a gargantuan celebration of Victory Day, the 75th anniversary of, quote, their victory over the Nazis with a huge and flamboyant military parade and the immortal regiment marches. These are public commemorations involving tens of millions of people, more on that later. The country was in serious lockdown with international travel uh, to and from Russia banned for months, rules about wearing masks and gloves. Um, but now, even though cases continue to increase, normal life or so-called normal life has resumed in many places, including Moscow. Um, some people wear masks, others don't, no one wears gloves, people freely ride the metro, congregate in restaurants and bars, going to movie theaters. Um, they've already for weeks now, I, I know this even from my friends, eating in each other's kitchens indoors as they have from decades for decades on end. The Bolshoi Theater, the famous Bolshoi Theater in Moscow, um, reopened on September 6th, but then it closed four days later when a soloist in, in the ongoing opera contracted the virus. Uh, you might have heard of Russia's much touted Sputnik vaccine. Now it hasn't engendered much confidence and half the country claims they would never even try it. Try it. Um, there's now fear of a second wave and rumors that today, actually, they were worried about today, September 15th, the mayor of Moscow would close the city again. Indeed, there seems to be almost more fear of another lockdown than there had been fear of a second wave of the ap epidemic. And another factor in social fear right now is that people are, if we're skeptical about Russian information, so were the Russian people. They are skeptical about the information about COVID related by the authorities. In July, a full three quarters, uh, th three quarters of people in a reliable poll, three quarters of people under 55, and almost half of those over 65 disbelieve official information about the course of the pandemic. So what are they thinking about Putin? What kinds of attitudes? I do a lot of um, research uh, on, uh, uh, by looking at polls. There's one very reliable polling agency called the Nevada Polling Agency. Uh, the population's attitudes towards authorities um, has always changed in extreme situations. And the pandemic, of course, was a prime example. Um, and um, in February, many hoped that the pandemic would not come to Russia. So uh, people believed that um, things were going well in the country as a whole. Um, and then from April to July, it, it dropped vastly because the pandemic did set in. In August, the pandemic was no longer perceived as a threat. So it immediately led to an increase in the number of people who were confident um, in the direction of the country. And the same thing was true with 
uh, Vladimir Putin, um, he, his approval rating um, dropped uh, to from 69% to 60% and from April to July. But then um, uh, at the end of August, it rose to 66%. It's true the economy is not good. The ruble against the dollar is very bad. But most people in Russia overwhelmingly favor the status quo. And Putin certainly represents the status quo. Uh, likely for a long time since the constitutional reforms uh, about which my political science colleague will speak will allow Putin two more consecutive six-year terms after his current term expires in 2024. So if things are so stable, if we could take a look at the image for this poster now, please. There it is. Okay, so if things are so stable, well, it's so big that I can't even see my notes now. Um, why is, is this uh, person who looks like a young Woody Allen holding up the sign that says Putinism uh, with a line through it, very anti-Putin? Thank you, we don't need the image anymore. You can stop sharing the screen. Um, and, uh, and, and the photograph was taken in Russia's Far East in the city of Khabarovsk. Um, it, the, the photo was taken last month and um, today, September 15th, marked the 64th consecutive day of protests in this far eastern city. So it's kind of analogous to Portland, Oregon, of course, without the calamitous fires. Since early July, the city of Khabarovsk in the Russian Far East um, has become the scene of mass protests after the local governor of the city was arrested uh, by the authorities on charges of serious crimes committed 15 years ago. Now, this is Russia, so when they say serious crimes, they mean it. Um, this was, uh, this, there were actually rumors that he was linked to murders, um, but uh, many people believe that he was framed and people um, regarded those charges as politically motivated. And the protests that began in early July have continued day after day. It goes on um, and the participants carry signs that increasingly sound anti-Moscow and anti-Putin. The city's governor had been very popular because he had been genuinely effective, sort of a populist who had got things done, who had curbed the excess of local, excesses of local elites, instituted a free lunch uh, school program, uh, school lunch program, um, and then he was jailed for sp sp suspected complicity for crimes done um, 15 years ago and more. And then an acting governor was sent out from Moscow, just the wrong kind of man, arrogant, out of touch. Um, and what's salient is that this governor who was arrested um, is not in the United Russia party that supports, pu supports Putin. It's, it's not an opposition party, but it's an alternate party. Um, and the Kremlin has been for years managing to get their own people into power in the important cities and regions. And this is a protest against that centralization. Um, uh, the Kremlin was concerned and is concerned about these protests, but since they have been retained, they have uh, been contained locally and not spread widely, even though there has been some spread, I don't think the Kremlin's truly alarmed. The uh, Belarus protests are another matter. And again, my colleague in political science is going to um, talk about that. I chose, I have to admit this protest image, not it, because it is a world shattering protest or a Russia shattering protest, but because I'm shot tired of showing Putin. I see him every day on my refrigerator and he's getting very domesticated. We usually see him topless on a horse. And here, the September image, he's teaching the president of China to make blini, which are Russian crepes. Um, and I don't think that any of you are gonna like the, uh, the November one, which is really scary because it's a photograph of, of, of Putin congratulating Trump on his reelection. You like that? I don't think you like it. Um, there it is, and uh, it does sit on my um, refrigerator. Moving um, on very um, quickly to Alexei Navalny, um, the uh, young man who was uh, poisoned, young. He's 44 years old. He's bold, he's courageous. 
uh, an opposition figure, indeed the, the by far the best known of Russia's oppositionists. He's sometimes referred to as the leader of Russia's opposition, but he is no such thing because there is no opposition in Russia, nothing that might be called an oppositional movement at all. The local opposition oppositionists who mostly battle against corrupt or unduly authoritarian local, authority, local authorities are scared, scattered in various Russian cities, such as Novosibirsk and Tomsk, two Siberian cities in which Navalny had been campaigning with his colleagues there, oppositionist colleagues, right before being poisoned. And in fact, in local elections this past Sunday in those two cities, pro-Kremlin United Russia candidates lost seats to some of um, Navalny's allies in election, local elections for city council. As you know, he was poisoned, or may you might know, with a nerve agent um, in, the fam in, the, sort of in the family of something called Navichuk, according to the Berlin doctors who treated him at an airport cafe in Tomsk. Um, just before um, where he was poisoned just before uh, boarding a plane to Moscow. And the plane made an emergency landing in the Siberian city of Omsk where local doctors declared they had found no evidence of poison. In fact, they didn't even want to have him allow him to leave the country. Um, but finally, um, his wife and his supporters prevailed. He was flown to Berlin um, and the doctor stated he had been poisoned in fact by this nerve agent, uh, a poison that's almost entirely in state control, one used in an infamous double poisoning of a double agent um, and his daughter in Salisbury, England in 2018. Um, there's been a long history of persecuting the Navalny with arrests and house arrests based on trumped up charges, huge, huge fines. He also almost lost the sight in one eye after being splashed with a toxic green chemical in 2017. Who poisoned him? It's virtually impossible to believe that the poisoning was the work of anyone near Putin, not to speak of Putin himself. It would make no sense. It would be vastly dangerous. You know, Western politicians and media often so, so often assume that everything, especially everything dastardly was done in, that, that was done in Russia was ordered by Putin himself. It's a kind of magical thinking, which really um, I just don't agree with at all. Is he really a threat to the Kremlin? I don't think so. Indeed, there was a recent poll published September 3rd asking if the election of the Russian president were held next Sunday, with who, for whom would you vote? 40% said Putin, 2% said Navalny. It's more likely that the poisoning might have been ordered by one of his enemies. He has many enemies. He has exposed corruption in, in many places. I think what's most important that no one in the media is asking is, um, think about what happened after the, um, the murder of George Floyd in our country. Why has Russia not erupted in protests over this poisoning? Where are the protests? Where are the people? Even in Moscow and in, in, in St. Petersburg. And the answer is that um, Navalny has only a small following, mostly only the support of others like himself in other regions. Of course, the liberal intelligentsia were dismayed and shocked, but they're small in number. Um, and besides, this happened August 20th. People were relieved to be on vacation. They couldn't be bothered. They didn't care. Just in the last two minutes, the last topic, the 75th anniversary of the victory was supposed to be, as I said, gargantuan. It's a huge holiday in Russia anyway, but the plans had to be altered on May 9th, Victory Day. There was just a flyover of planes. There were fireworks, people singing on their balconies. There was finally a victory parade on June 24th, which was actually the 75th anniversary of the original Victory Day that was held in, in, in 1945 um, with, um, thousands of troops, shoulder to shoulder, no masks. The immortal regiment parades had to be given up. But still, and this is what I want to end with, um, all of this aroused a feeling of national pride and patriotism. There were World War II movies, uh, TV series. No one in Russia is removing monuments. No one is up upending public, public holidays um, or trashing historic heroic figures. And in this, Russia, for all its troubles, including, I might add, the plummeting value of the ruble, it nonetheless appears societally strong and united, 
even as the Russian government persistently and effectively moves to weaken the societies and democratic institutions of the United States and Western Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Demarkin, uh, for your very interesting comments. And uh, I just wanted, I went through all the participants of this Zoom session and wanted to uh, send a shout out to colleagues and students, former students, current students, um, former colleagues, retired colleagues. I can see you all out there and I appreciate your being here. So thank you. All right, our next speaker is uh, Tom Hodge. Uh, thanks very much, Adam. Um, I hope you can all hear me. Um, thanks, Nina, for those incisive comments. Thank you, Nina, also for um, organizing tonight's event. It's so good to be back with everybody, uh, even though it is remotely. Um, it's always illuminating to hear what everyone has to say. We've got some um, people who really know what they're talking about here at Wellesley. It's one of the, the great blessings of um, this program. Um, so Adam, thanks a lot for that introduction. And Christiana, thank you for being here. It's great that you're on the team now. Um, and I just wanna echo what Adam just said. It, I look at the participants list and it's just fabulous to see all these familiar names um, from the past, the present, um, some in the future, um, some first years are there. So um, anyway, um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to um, speak about some pretty depressing stuff. So I'm gonna limit myself, I hope to 15 minutes, cause you're not gonna wanna hear much more than 15 minutes of what I've got to say and show you, I'm afraid. Um, and this is always the fate of the environmental reporter. So let me get my slideshow up and going. And then I can be off and running here. So, how is that looking? Are we seeing a slideshow yet? There we go. Adam, how does that look? Okay, good. All right. Um, so, it's not advancing. Let's see. There we go. So, um, I think one of the reasons I get tapped in this collective to talk about the environment is that um, I spend a lot of time in Siberia, or I have over the past two decades. Here's a photograph from the course that I have co-taught co off and on for two decades with my wonderful colleague, Marianne Moore, um, from the biology department, uh, Professor Emerita of biology, and she is in attendance tonight. Marianne, I, I say hello to you. I wish I could talk to you. <laughs> um, and so here we see some happy, smiling students at Lake Baikal in Siberia. Um, Lake Baikal, if you can see my pointer, is this large banana-shaped object just to the east of Irkutsk, which is circled in red. This map will help orient you. This is um, a pretty decent map of Siberia, which basically is just a term that we use to refer to um, the northern half of Asia between the Ural Mountains and the Pacific Ocean. So this huge uh, area, which has about eight time zones, um, is Siberia. It is uh, the, the, the treasure trove of Russia's natural resources. Now, I've spent a lot of time around Irkutsk and on all over the place on Lake Baikal. Here's a map of Baikal. Irkutsk is down here in the lower left. Um, Many of you may know of the uh, Lake Baikal course that we've taught at Wellesley for so long now. Um, and if you don't know about it, I urge you to take a look at the course webpage. Um, the URL for it is right here for you. Um, and also we've got um, the blog that you can read from 2019. We were I was last in Siberia with the course um, just last summer. Um, Professor Weiner and Professor Katrin Monica from the Geosciences Department will be co-teaching it this spring and summer. And if you have questions about the course, um, please do talk to them because I'm, I know they'd be happy to, to hear from you. All right, um, if I can get into my story, um, which is going to be 
um, basically an overview of a lot of news stories having to do with the environment in Russia, specifically Siberia, that I think would have been much, much um, more prominent if we hadn't been in the middle of a pandemic and preoccupied with that all summer long and right up to the present day. Um, so the first thing, and I will get to the heat wave and the, um, the, the terrible wildfires that Professor Tumarkin mentioned, but first thing I wanted to do was talk about some catastrophes that have taken place um, in and around the Northwest Siberian city of Narilsk. Um, there was a terrible diesel fuel spill there, chemical wastewater dumping into the tundra, a landfill fire and jet fuel leak. And I just wanna talk a little bit about these particular catastrophes. So where is Narilsk? Here's our map of Siberia. Narilsk is here next to the Yenisei River, which flows like all the great Siberian rivers from south to north, emptying into the Arctic Ocean, in this case, the Kara Sea. Um, so Narilsk is about mm, 40 miles away from the Yenisei, which is one of the largest rivers in the world. It's enormous. Um, and Narilsk is basically a company town. Um, it was created in the early 20th century um, with the sole purpose of extracting natural resources from that area. Um, it is now owned by um, a private company, um, or that is to say a publicly traded company that is controlled by three oligarchs. Um, a man named uh, uh, Vladimir Patanin has about 35% ownership and then Oleg Diripaska um, has about 28% and then um, Roman Abramovich has about a 5% stake and the rest, the last 30% or so is publicly owned. So you can actually buy shares of stock in this company, which in Russian is called Narnikel, um, Narilsky Nikel. Why? Because this is the largest deposit of nickel on the planet. Um, this company, Nor Nickel, Narnikel, is a behemoth. It, um, last year, it had $13.6 billion in revenue. Um, and I'll try to explain why nickel is so important um, as we go along. Now, here is the Yenisei Basin. You can see that um, it drains, among other things, the Lake Baikal watershed via the Angara River. So anything that uh, comes out of Narilsk by way of pollution ends up in the Yenisei. It's going to end up in the Arctic Sea. And um, there have been some pretty tragic stories uh, along those lines, including some I'm going to talk to you about now. Um, one of the big problems that we are witnessing with global climate change and the warming of the planet um, is especially near the poles in the Arctic and the Antarctic. And here you see a chart that, um, a map that shows you what's been happening with permafrost, which is permanently frozen um, ground. Russians call it Vietnam Mirzlata. Um, and Narilsk, as you can see, is located well above the Arctic Circle, and it is absolutely in the zone of what in the past has been continuous permafrost. The trouble is that frozen ground is thawing, and when that ground thaws, any structures that are built on it are put at risk. They become unstable, they topple, they break down. Now, in late May, a diesel storage tank that belongs to Nornickel um, allegedly because the permafrost underneath it had become unstable, leaked 21,000 metric tons of diesel fuel into the local river, which is the Ambarnaya River, which eventually drains in, uh, into the Yenisei. Um, and you can see in these photographs that I've, that I've put on this page, what this stuff looked like. It, it's colored red and it turned this entire river red. Um, down here you can see the kind of orange uh, disgusting fluid flowing on the left hand side um, and in the center picture you see a bottle of some uh, of some of the liquid that somebody just scooped up. Um, that bottle was then lit on fire and that was broadcast via YouTube. Now this is by far 
the biggest fuel spill in Russian history. The, the worst one before this was 5,000 metric tons, one quarter as much fuel that was spilled into the Kerch Strait in um, the Black Sea back in 2007. Putin was outraged because Putin didn't learn about this from the authorities. He learned about it via social media. It was very reminiscent of a similar chemical spill that remains unexplained that took place back in 2016 at another river near Narilsk, um, where a chemical uh, effluent turned the river blood red. Um, these are not retouched photos. There are no um, filters being used there. That's what the water really looked like. Then, about a month later, um, in late June, 6,000 cubic meters of chemical waste were dumped directly into the tundra um, at Nornickel's Talnach enrichment plant. And workers, when they were discovered by various um, uh, environmental activists who were on the scene because of what had happened a month earlier with um, the diesel fuel spell, uh, spill rather, um, they were so nervous because they were being photographed and so on, they sent heavy equipment to clean out these pipes or to remove these pipes and stop dumping the chemical effluent into the tundra that, as you can see in the lower right-hand photograph, the heavy equipment they were using accidentally backed into a car and crushed it, which may not be the end of the world, but this car belonged to the police in Narilsk who had dispatched prosecutors from the prosecutor's office to go investigate the spill. And so they're being um, prosecuted for damaging government property as well. So that's at the end of June. The very next day, the news, the bad news continues to come in. There is a filthy um, industrial waste landfill that catches on fire. No one exactly knows how. And of course, all the activists are there with their cell phone cameras. And they were also taking pictures of this and broadcasting it on social media. Um, then, uh, two weeks after that, 45 metric tons of aviation fuel leaked from Nornickel's um, natural gas facility, Narilsk Transgas, um, which is near Tuchard on the other side, on the west side of the Yenisei River, about 100 miles from Narilsk. Um, and that fuel spilled right into a major tributary of the Yenisei, and of course, all of that um, aviation fuel ended up right in, right in the, the river and eventually right in the Arctic Sea. Um, these, these are hugely uh, destructive environmental catastrophes. Greenpeace Russia is comparing the diesel fuel spell, spill rather, excuse me, of late May to the 1989 Exxon Valdez disaster. Um, I'm Running out of time, I'll pick up the pace a little bit. There was a tremendous heat wave in Siberia that you did probably read about. That was covered widely in the Western media. And um, the, the top um, Russian climate scientist um, has said that the five hottest years in Russian history have occurred in the last five years. And as you may know, Earth's poles are warming faster than the rest of the planet and temperatures in Siberia which is home to much of the world's carbon-rich permafrost. So the permafrost actually traps lots of carbon. Um, we're more than 5% hotter than average between January and June. That is a huge jump. Um, sorry, five degrees centigrade hotter than average. That's nine degrees Fahrenheit. So if you wanna look at the worst case scenario, it's in this map. Um, the scale on the left-hand side is showing um, this is under the most um, extreme assumptions about how bad it could get in the rest of the, 21st, the rest of the 21st century. Um, and these are potential rises in, in degrees Celsius across all of Russia. Um, and look at what's happening in Siberia in particular, especially Northern Siberia. Um, so Russia is warming at two and a half times the global average since the 1970s. Um, so it is possible, according to this scenario, that there are going to be winter, average winter temperature increases as high as 11 degrees Celsius. That's 20 degrees Fahrenheit by the end of the century. Um, the most rosy um, estimates suggest about a five uh, degree uh, temperature, average winter temperature increase um, by the end of 
uh, the the 21st century. Um, these are terrible. This is terrible news. And the fires that you may have heard about are directly related to the climate change. Um, contrary to what you may hear from certain heads of state, the two are directly related. Why? Well, if you take a look at this map of the taiga in Russia, um, you will see that um, sweeping all the way across the continent um, in the northern regions of Russia, you've got these bands of seemingly endless boreal forest. Um, so there are enormous forests um, in all of these green zones that you see. Um, these have been made absolutely tinder dry by these freakishly hot um, heat waves that Siberia has been experiencing all summer long um, and has been experiencing more and more the last several years. Here's just a, a collage of photographs from this year's fires, which were tremendously destructive and tremendously numerous. Um, According to Greenpeace Russia, most Siberian wildfires are actually started by people um, going about their business, not by, for example, by lightning strikes as we've seen in the West Coast um, of late. Um, Russia's forestry agency has decided not to extinguish 91% of these fires because they are located in so-called kontrolne zone, the control zones. Um, so these control zones, which are not inhabited, which is true of the vast majority of, of Northern Siberia, um, are just allowed to burn. And you may say, well, what's the point in putting them out if, if they're not hurting anybody? The fact is, unfortunately, they are hurting the environment. Um, in 2019, we had an area the size of Greece burn in Russia. You may remember this last year, we were all horrified by it because it was the worst year um, recorded in Russia as far as wildfires. Um, Siberian fires dumped the equivalent of 181 million metric tons of carbon dioxide into the um, atmosphere. But in 2020, it's far worse. Um, wildfires in the Arctic alone have emitted 35% more CO2 than in all of 2019 as much as 245 million tons of CO2 had been released from Arctic wildfires up to August 24th. Um, 600 active fires were observed in Siberia by late July 2020 compared to 400 in 2019, which we thought was nightmarish. Um, and that's uh, up from an average of about 100 earlier uh, in the first decade of the, of the 21st century. So things are really getting worse and they're getting worse quickly. Um, I'll wrap up by talking ab about a couple of strange topographical repercussions um, in Siberia this year um, that you may have read about in the paper. Um, the first is uh, th the first has to do with the so-called Batagaika crater, which is way over here in the Sakha Republic um, above the Arctic Circle, and this is what happens when permafrost melts. So. This is known as a permafrost crater or a mega slump. Um, and this is the largest such crater in the world. It's a kilometer long and it's growing 12 to 14 meters a year. So that's a meter every month. Um, and of course that, that happens during the, uh, the warm weather months. So it actually um, in, enlarges itself by that much almost before your eyes. So if you're there in the summertime, you can almost see it growing. Um, and then to wrap up on the Yamal Peninsula, which as you can see is um, a little bit to the, to the west of Narilsk. Um, it's the native land of the uh, Nyenets people. We are seeing g enormous methane craters proliferate. Now um, you can read that little text to bone up on what we think is probably causing these methane craters. But basically what's happening is that methane gas is being trapped just below the surface and has been trapped and basically imprisoned below the surface uh, of Northern Siberia um, for, as, you know, for millions of years. 
Now what's happening is that it's warming and that gas is being released. So if you look at the, the photo in the lower left, that's what it looked like in 2014. You can see there's sort of a bubble in the, in, in the, in the Earth's um, surface there. And then that bubble explodes and there's a sort of catastrophic explosion that belches up um, all sorts of methane. And if, if you think, well, what's the big deal about methane? Well, it's, it's 30 times more potent um, as a greenhouse gas than CO2 is. It's way worse than CO2 when it comes to warming the planet. Finally, um, here's the most recent one. Um, this one was discovered uh, in July, uh, just a couple months ago, and it's been called the pit to hell in the press, including the New York Times. Um, and it is the 17th such uh, gigantic uh, explosion of methane gas um, on the Yamal Peninsula. Um, so this is accelerating, and I'm afraid it is bad news for all of us. Um, finally, I will just end by um, uh, letting you know that this stuff may seem irrelevant to you, or it may seem as though it doesn't touch on us, but um, the carbon that is being released in Siberia is a huge threat to the rest of the world. And I can also tell you that the company, Nor Nickel, is one of, the, one of the filthiest companies in the entire world. That region is considered to be, um, that city of Narilsk is considered by the Russians themselves to be the, the most polluted city in their country. Um, and if you're wondering why there's all this demand for nickel, well, I will tell you that the main reason at the moment is that nickel um, is used to create the cathodes on lithium ion batteries, um, especially now for electric vehicles. So these vehicles that we think of as being green and good for the planet actually are creating tremendous demand for um, nickel to be exported from Narilsk. And in fact, Elon Musk, the, the head of Tesla in July, uh, put out an announcement saying he wants more nickel. Nickel is going to run out in around 2023 unless um, supply is ramped up. And of course, nor nickel in Narilsk would love to oblige him. Um, but, you know, Musk is going, it seems, he's sending signals that he's going to um, only play ball with those Russian suppliers if they figure out a way to clean up their act. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, sorry, this is so depressing. Um, thanks for your attention. Over to you, Christiana. Um, thank you, Tom. <clears throat> Stark and sobering indeed. So our last speaker tonight is Christiana Barricello, and uh, I'm going to let you take over, Christiana. Uh, thank you. Um, that was sobering, and I'm afraid I'm not going to give a jolly uh, account here of events, of recent events myself. But um, nevertheless, I'll go ahead and share my screen so you can see this presentation here. Uh, so I'm going to talk, um, well, first, actually, thank you for including me in this uh, Russia Now panel. I'm very excited to be here, and I'm excited to be teaching at Wellesley in the third term. I'll be teaching territorial politics in Europe and Russia, and I can't wait to meet some Wellesley students. Uh, and I'm very excited about that opportunity, and thank you also for uh, your introduction, Adam. Um, and I'm just going to say a few, say, say a bit about the referendum in uh, late June and July in Russia on the Constitution, and also about mass protests in Belarus that have started up since, um, since the August election in which uh, there was a disputed, uh, much disputed outcome. So I'll start with the referendum. And uh, after several delays, thanks to the pandemic, the referendum vote originally scheduled for April finally took place uh, from June 25th to July 1st. So Russians had a whole week to vote on a set of reforms to the 1993 constitution. And 
Well, the most discussed reform was certainly the reset of Putin's term limits. Um, there were over 200 reforms that were all packaged together and Russians were invited to vote for or against. And thus, while the prospect of uh, Putin forever or Putin for life or Putin till 2036, as I've called it here to keep it short, um, may have not been the preference of many Russians, the Kremlin tried to make the deal more attractive by adding in some populist promises and reminders of Putin's commitment to what the Kremlin sees as popular policies and issue positions uh, among likely voters. So the proposed reform package was a mixed bag and it was strategically formulated to lure voters to the polls and drum up support among some of Putin's most likely uh, supporters, pensioners and military, military and security personnel. And this is always a desire of the Kremlin in recent, recent democratic events that involve voting because they want us, they want to give a sense of legitimacy, even though many don't feel motivated to participate in elections and um, don't feel motivated to come out to vote if they feel that the conclusion is already known before it happens, or if they feel that um, sort of their voice is not important. Uh, so this package included things like a guarantee for regular pension increases by linking pensions to an index, uh, which is a little redundant since uh, something like this is already included in Russian law. And it also had a promise to make minimum wage no lower than a living wage. And it had, it contained changes uh, nodding to Putin's support for conservative ideology. Uh, defining marriage as a union between a man and a woman and referring to Russia's ancestral faith in God. Uh, it had several sort of nationalist uh, reforms, adding text to the constitution that forbids the session or calling for the secession of any territory from the Federation, probably uh, a reference to Crimea. It also forbid acts or speech diminishing the service of Russian veterans in the world wars and even asserted the Russian state's responsibility for preserving the so-called historical truth of those wars. Um, so we can think that sort of these are some strange things to include in a constitution if we were to look at other constitutions um, and that it's sort of questionable how they might be enforced uh, how how would you enforce this kind of this kind of ban on um, this this ban on references to diminishing the the efforts of veterans? Um, but nevertheless, they were they were in this mixed bag, as I've called it. Uh, finally, some reforms granted the president the right to dismiss ministers, including the prime minister, with little input from the Duma. And while the Duma is granted control over some ministerial posts in the reforms, a not so short list of the most important ministers with um, are still going to be appointed by the president with no approval needed from the parliament. And so if Russia was already a super presidential system since the 1993 constitution, I think we might we might think of this as movement towards from presidential super presidentialism to dictatorship light, um, and while these institutional changes are supposedly permanent, uh, the term reset for Putin only applies to Putin, right? So it's sort of there's sort of this little uh, bonus in the bag that's just for Putin, and future Russian presidents under the reforms should be limited to two six-year terms in office. And they're also not going to be allowed to use Putin's earlier strategy of temporarily giving up control um, to a supporter like Dmitry Medvedev and then resuming their role later. Although if a similar referendum could be carried out and the results padded by electoral fraud, then what is to stop a future president from changing the constitution just like Putin? So we can just w think about sort of how, how important are institutions if they can be changed every 10 years or so um, to suit the career ambitions of the person in charge. Uh, and Putin might mean this to be a one-time thing for himself, but 
he has now solidified the precedent that was set by Yeltsin that the president can change the constitution at will as he sees fit. Uh, so many are saying the referendum was just a big PR exercise and that an actual, no actual vote was really important here. And this was meant to secure an appearance of majority support for Putin's future bid to run in 2024 and 2030. And analyses based on precinct level voting data, uh, voting results suggest unprecedented fraud was necessary to secure the Kremlin's desired outcome in spite of the week long uh, period of voting. And it was extremely difficult to monitor the vote uh, because it stretched on for a week. So you would need a lot of monitors to be there for 16 hours a day at all of the polling stations. And ostensibly this week long period was due to concerns about uh, coronavirus, but it also was very convenient for making it extremely difficult to monitor um, the voting and also, a bunch of other coronavirus justified oddities appeared, uh, including some online voting system and unmonitored ballot boxes. Some You can find images of ballot boxes on playgrounds with a couple people sort of just sitting there with a megaphone as, as uh, the neighborhood dogs are walking by. You can just toss your ballot in. And there were even, uh, as pictured here, uh, teams going around like kind of like census workers picking up ballots at people's homes. So there were a lot of different ways that we couldn't monitor, uh, that no one could monitor uh, the election in the voting in this case. And also only the curiously named government operated non-government operation uh, organizations were even allowed to really monitor the elections on a systematic level. Um, but fraud and coerced voting were unquestionably at play given many irregularities that were reported to Golis, uh, which is an independent election monitoring organization. And we do have evidence from uh, Sergei Spilkin's analysis. Um, he's a physicist who is now also an election data analyst, and he has developed a method for estimating uh, fraud given the what we know that about the way precincts try to please the Kremlin by meeting certain turnout targets and uh, targets of the percent supporting the pro-Kremlin outcome. So according to his estimates, um, uh, the the sort of vote, the ballot stuffing was worse in this referendum than it has been in any previous election, uh, even though um, even though the outcome was was sort of foregone of, of, of a pre-known conclusion and the parliament had already passed all of these reforms long ago in the spring. So uh, it seems pretty important to the Kremlin to have gotten this outcome uh, given, all this, given all this effort they've made to sort of simulate public support. Uh, but what are the implications of these events for the future of Russian politics? I can't, um, speak to what will happen. I don't want to pr make predictions, but uh, Putin coyly refuses to say, as is his custom, whether he will run in 2024 and may, maybe he will find some other way to stay in power before then without actually becoming president. Uh, he might be able to rule from any number of bodies that have been created in, in the federal state. He might even be able to get a confederation with Belarus and then rule from behind the scenes as someone in charge of this confederation. Um, who knows what he'll do? Um, but other, some have insisted that even if he does run that he might not win because of external shocks that could cause a tank in his popularity, like coronavirus and like falling oil prices, which combined with internal policy decisions, um, for example, Putin shifted the responsibility of responding to the virus to regional governors and mayors. This was an unpopular decision. Uh, there's been a severe lack of investment in critical sectors of the Russian economy, causing stagnation. And then uh, foreign policy, uh, the adventurism in Ukraine is popular with some, unpopular with others, and does prolong these Western sanctions that are another source of uh, another um, hit on the Russian economy. So some have suggested that any of these things could hurt Putin's iron, seemingly iron grip on the presidency and make him potentially lose in 2024, 2030. In my opinion, 
given the extent of fraud in this referendum in recent elections, um, the repeated elimination of any remotely competitive rival, nearly insurmountable barriers to new party formation in, and candidacy, I think it is unlikely that Putin could lose if he ran in 2024 and 2030, unless something really changed about the Russian institutions before then. But as we will see in the next uh, topic I'm gonna discuss, things can change suddenly and in an unexpected direction as they have recently in Belarus. So a few years ago, no one would have expected a, uh, a, an uprising, uprisings of any significant size in Belarus, but uh, this past summer we have seen uh, a bunch of challengers taking on the incumbent, the longtime incumbent, uh, Alexander Lukashenko, and maybe his denial and bungling of the pandemic, refusing to institute lockdowns, maybe this gave additional advantage to his challengers. Um, for whatever reason, though, we saw we saw several people uh, who were quite popular try to run in the elections against him, and this forced his hand. He had to cut the competition down to size, and as any authoritarian ruler living next door to Vladimir Putin, he had to make sure that challengers were either denied registration, arrested, or uh, both until he was satisfied that there was no real competition. But uh, he appears to have misjudged the competition, nonetheless, deeming, deeming uh, it insignificant and then um, also ignoring the, the popular will behind that competition. So I'm just going to quickly introduce some of the players in this recent, um, in the recent events before the protest started. So we had three challengers who were eliminated one by one, Sergei Sikhanovsky, a uh, popular YouTube vlogger who was jailed in May after announcing his presidential bid and on charges of, uh, you know, attacking a police officer. Um, just some charges come up with probably by, by officials. And next, Viktor Vavariko was detained along with his son in mid-June on charges of illegal financial activities, another favorite. And then a third challenger, uh, Valery Tsepkala uh, fled the country in late July after the Central Electoral Commission claimed that his campaign had collected a bunch of invalid signatures, so he was denied registration, but then he received some threats and his children received some threats, so he also fled. And in the absence of these candidates, Lukashenko thought he was safe, and even though um, Tikhanovsky and Tsepkala's wives, Svetlana here in the center and Veronika here on the left, joined forces with Bavariko's uh, campaign manager, Maria Kalesnikova, um, supporting Svetlana Tsikhanovska as the candidate for election. So in the days before the election, Lukashenko dismissed this, uh, this opposition as a threat, saying that Belarus would never elect a woman, that it wasn't a sufficiently mature state, whatever he means by that. And he continued then to arrest and intimidate opposition figures and journalists just in case. And it still wasn't enough because on August 9th, uh, the night of the election, big protests uh, started to heat up and the police response was ready um, as results came in claiming that Lukashenko had won by a landslide with some 80% to Tikhanovska's 10%, which was rejected by the opposition as completely fraudulent. Um, Sikhanovska was detained and threatened and fled to Lithuania, where she is seeking the help from Western organizations and states to pressure Lukashenko to step down or otherwise come to some compromise to allow uh, what she, she claims to be the rightful winner of the election and wants to um, see some kind of transitional government and promises to hold new free and fair elections if she comes to power. Um, so mass protests have continued since then on every, every Sunday since August 9th and have at times reached between 100,000 and 250,000 strong according to the New York Times, Reuters, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty and other sources. And I'm citing those sources here because um, it's kind of hard to be sure of numbers during this time when 
inflating, deflating, or the outright fabrication of numbers of protesters, supporters, deaths, anything is commonplace and not isolated to the post-Soviet region, but happens also in Western countries. Um, so, but we can see from the photographic evidence here that uh, the scale of the mass protests in Minsk and other significant Belarusian cities is not being exaggerated by these sources. Um, so international and domestic outcries against police and security forces use of violence uh, have been numerous in this case, even when protests remain mostly peaceful. Security forces have used a number of violent methods, especially rubber bullets, to disperse and intimidate protesters. And generally, while generally the large group protests um, have sort of carried on with some holiday parade sort of atmosphere as families and strollers are marching along and everyone's dressed in patriotic colors, they're on the sidelines um, and behind the scenes, opposition leaders are being targeted and jailed. And when crowds are assembling and dispersing for protests or when say a group, a small group breaks off from the main group, um, plainclothes officers or security forces will swoop in and drag people off in vans and in some cases beat them severely. And uh, human rights organizations have reported that police have even used live ammunition in some cases. Belarusian officials themselves have reported arresting over 6,000 people back in early August, but human rights groups at the time estimated 1,300 people. So estimates vary widely. And only what, what it seems pretty consistent is that it, it seems that less than 10 protesters have died as a result of police beatings, shootings, or a lack of timely medical treatment. But the specific numbers are still almost every almost every account of death uh, even with video footage is contested by different news sources with different motives and um, I'm just going to conclude with talking about the implications for Belarusian politics. Lukashenko has been wildly inconsistent. Uh, well he's been consistently inconsistent with accusations of foreign interference from every side the West, NATO, Russia, Ukraine everyone is uh, interfering according to Lukashenko. Uh, but since the election and protests began, Putin's phone has been ringing off the hook and Putin has generally shown support for Lukashenko by publicly taking the phone calls and pledging to provide police support and yesterday a huge loan to um, shore up liquidity of the Belarusian banks and Russian officials have unexpectedly also positively responded to Tsikhanovskaya and her coordination council because they have made these statements that they have no plans to put Belarus on some kind of pro-European track. They would want to continue to have good relations with Russia. They're not a, this is not a question of pro-Europe or pro-Russia as, as it has been in other cases where, where Russia has um, intervened. And Belarus's economy remains heavily dependent on Russian oil and gas with nearly 50% of its trade going on with Russia. Its next highest, its next largest trade partner being the EU with only 18%. And so it's hard to imagine a realistic scenario in which Belarus would attempt to reorient itself towards the West quickly, even if, um, even if the opposition were uh, wanting to start a more pro-European foreign policy and economic policy. Um, one thing that I did note um, in uh, searching for photos and reading various news articles to share with you about the last couple of days was that Russian-backed uh, news sources have been spreading stories that the EU and Lithuania and the US are rec recognizing Tsikhanovskaya and are interfering in the situation, which of course Russian officials condemn. And there have been some claims that uh, from other from the West, that Western sources that unmarked troops and military vehicles have been passing into Minsk and other cities to support security services there, which may sound familiar. It's consistent with tactics in Ukraine and policing protests in Russia. And given other reports uh, that some security forces might potentially sympathize with protesters, this influx of non-local forces who are less likely to sympathize with protesters and have more training in intimidating and deflating protests 
could help Lukashenko outlast the opposition. Um, the information war over, you know, what is going on exactly on the ground, whether in Ukraine or Belarus, uh, is ongoing. And it's sort of difficult to tell numbers, but we can sort of see a, co a, a consistent narrative coming from Russian sources that the West is trying to interfere and that that those, it's hard to find any source, for any Western source verifying any of the stories about, for example, some of the stories say like Lithuania has already recognized Tsikhanovskaya um, as the official leader of uh, Belarus and some of these things, it's hard to find any Western source verifying those things. Um, well, I can't say what Russia will do. My best guess is that even as Putin supports Lukashenko using his own credibility, um, sending birthday congratulations and having in-person meetings and uh, publicly promising uh, support for security services, he is still going to leave the option of abandoning Lukashenko open um, and he would entertain any opportunities to get a more useful neighbor uh, for Russia in some opposition figure if, if he could find one. And I wonder if uh, Lukashenko's erratic and incompetent behavior and his continued resistance and stalling to further economic and political integration with Russia have made him disposable from Putin's perspective. Um, given the alleged fraud in the recent referendum, I don't think Putin can easily sort of and would never identify electoral fraud as the problem here, but I think he could find a way to remove his support for Lukashenko if he so desired. So I'm going to stop there to leave some time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christiana. This is, uh, those were very illuminating, I think, and excellent comments. And this is the point in the program where we usually um, clap our hands for the three speakers. Um, so if you could all imagine, um, uh, 200 hands or so clapping. Uh, I think you deserve it. <laughs> well done. Very good. We, uh, we, we soldiered on and we actually had our Russia Now panel. So um, thank you to our three speakers. And uh, I'd like to welcome again the audience to send questions for any speaker or all speakers to me. You can, in the chat, you can send me as moderator a question. So go right ahead. Let's see if we can get any questions. Um, the panelists can also ask questions of each other. I'll, oh, I, I have, uh, yeah, I have a question for you, Christiana. So I saw some extremely awkward, uncomfortable footage of Putin sitting next to Lukashenko. Did you see that? Um, I think it was from today, yesterday, I don't know. Um, and Putin looked very uncomfortable and irritated and annoyed and bored. His, he was tapping his feet in a very childish way, moving his hands around. It's just, and meanwhile, Lukashenko was pouring out his heart and saying that we, ha we are friends, we are friends, we must not abandon our friends or something like that. It, it looked awful. <laughs> what did you, did you see that and what did you think of it? Uh, I did see some photographs and uh, some sort of jokes about it on social media about saying sort of that Lukashenko looked like he was trying to explain to his mother why his last relationship did not result in marriage. Um, and I think that from, from what I could see of it, that's, it seems accurate that, uh, and, and it, it makes sense to us if we think about the incentives that Putin and Lukashenko have here, um, that Putin would sort of be, uh, and, and sometimes I think Putin can be like this with United Russia uh, officials who get out of hand. You know, you're allowed to cheat and lie. You're allowed to, you know, be corrupt as long as you do it well enough and you prevent mass protest from interfering with the Kremlin and Putin's popularity. But once you create, once you set that off, you have to deal with your own 
follow the consequences of your own folly. And I wonder if in sort of an international context, looking over at Belarus, it might be if you aggravate people enough to draw in Western interference that irritates Putin and brings the eyes of NATO and the, and others looking into um, areas really close to the Russian border, then you have, you know, you have crossed the line. And I know Bel uh, I know Lukashenko was talking about the red line that Putin had set down um, in Ukraine that had been crossed. And I think, I think Lukashenko might have crossed Putin's red line in this case, so. Actually, since you're talking about that, we have a question coming in from uh, the audience. This is from a uh, year old uh, colleague in mathematics, Alan. He asked, what do you see as the long-term future of the situation in Eastern Ukraine? I, you might as well take that one. And if, if any, you know, if Tom and Nina has anything to add, then please raise your hand afterwards. Uh, I'll just say that much like we see in Abkhazia and South Ossetia and Nagorno-Karabakh and Transnistria, I think that Putin is all right with these, um, these frozen conflicts, as some call them, and that that suits him um, because it prevents uh, these countries from becoming sufficiently stable and that, that they would ever be admitted into NATO, which I think is what he really doesn't want to happen. And so I think he would be, uh, he wouldn't be, I'm guessing he wouldn't feel that we need to annex Eastern Ukraine in order for his sort of foreign policy outcomes to be met. That's, but I, I would, I would concede that Professor Shermakin is a much uh, more, is a much more experienced analyst of Putin's thoughts and his uh, considerations than I. So I'd love to hear what you think about that too. Sure. I'd first like to uh, respond just briefly uh, about Belarus and um, it's, it's what Putin thinks of Lukashenko, Lukashenko, which I think is not much. They had, you know, before there had been sort of talk about them being allies. Um, I, I think uh, Putin never liked Lukashenko, certainly never trusted him. I think he hopes that the protests will uh, weaken Lukashenko, as you suggest, maybe ultimately even to get rid of him but if not, at least to get him to agree to things like an advantageous energy deal, for example, um, and that there are several alternatives to uh, Lukashenko, including a Belarusian businessman who lives in, in Moscow. Um, so that's in the works. Um, I, I'm not sure I would, I would call the conflict in Ukraine totally frozen um, because no matter what they say, there still is fighting going on. People are, are still dying. Um, and um, I, I think the future looks very bad. Um, I do think that, that Putin's aim there, um, like with Belarus, is to weaken his, his neighbor, um, to keep it split. Uh, and uh, certainly I agree with Christiana, he's not about to start thinking about annexing any more Ukrainian territory or any other territory. Uh, I don't think so. Um, but certainly um, he wants to weaken, he wants to weaken the country and this ongoing conflict is very helpful in that regard. All right, thank you. I have a question from um, one of our Star students, Pamela. So uh, this is to Professor Hodge. I have a question for Professor Hodge. How much would anti-corruption policy help the environment um, in Russia? Anti-corruption policies. Uh, that's a great question. Um, the, 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 the Russian Republic does have um, an equivalent to the EPA. Um, the, what do they call it? The, the Ministry of Natural Resources and the Environment or Ministry of Natural Resources and Ecology. And so in theory, there is a system in place to handle this, but unfortunately, Russia is an extremely corrupt country. In fact, before the talk, um, to help put this in perspective, I took a look at uh, the latest um, report um, from Transparency International, which takes a very um, close analytical look at corruption 
um, in various countries around the world. And they come out each year with their uh, corruption perceptions index. And in 2019, out of 180 countries, just to sort of give you some context, the USA comes in 23rd place, right? So we're right after the United Arab Emirates and we're tied with France in our level of corruption. So out of 180, the US comes in 20, 23rd. Russia comes in 137th, um, tied with Uganda, Paraguay, Papua New Guinea, Mauritania, Liberia, Lebanon, Kenya, and the, and the Dominican Republic. And if, if any of you have spent much time in Russia, you know that bribery and um, cheating of various kinds, um, especially cheating um, the government um, and kickback schemes and so on are very common. And unfortunately, we've seen this time and again um, with our own eyes in Siberia. Um, there is really almost no oversight at all, even though officially there are mechanisms in place, as I mentioned. And so, yes, I think if there were some way to root out corruption um, in Siberia, we would see much better results. I mean, what's happening here in Narilsk, just to use that example, and then I'll, then I'll, um, I'll pipe down, but um, is that a few people happened to notice that there was this spill and they used social media to get the word out. And that's how anybody even found out about it. And, and that's why we saw a cascade of, um, wrongdoing or um, revelations of wrongdoing by Nor Nickel um, this summer. It, 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 this is just, it just, I think it, I think much of this has been going on all the time, but it's never been detected because the authorities are paid off. Um, everyone makes a lot of money from this stuff. No one has any incentive to, um, uh, to enforce environmental legislation, which can actually be pretty strict. Um, so Putin, as you may have read, I don't know if anybody's been keeping track of these stories, but Putin himself actually on June 3rd, um, when he learned about this, came down very hard publicly and gave a dressing down to the leadership of the Nornickel Corporation. Um, and he's making a lot of noise about criminal prosecution and making um, Vladimir Patanyan, the oligarch who has the, the lion's share of control of the company, um, pay for every bit of the cleanup. But who's going to do the cleanup? Um, how they're going to make sure that Patanin, who's actually very close to Putin, um, how they're going to make sure that he does what he says he does, what they're going to do with the contaminated waste that they do clean up, um, no one knows. So anyways, a long answer to a, um, a good question. And the simple answer is anti-corruption would be a tremendous help in this effort but don't hold your breath. Tom, there's a follow-up kind of a question on that. Yeah. Do Russians feel the same concern about climate change as others around the world? That's a, it's a good question. Um, officially, Russia likes to make a show of being concerned about climate change. So the Russian Federation is still a signatory of the Paris Accords. Um, as you may recall, we are, the United States no longer is. Um, but unfortunately, that really is just something that Russians call pakazucha. It's just for show. They don't, um, they don't enforce the Paris Accords. Um, so at a sort of official governmental level, they pay lip service to, to climate change. But there is so much money to be made from the quick and dirty extraction of natural wealth from uh, Russian lands that no one really cares about um, uh, really following through on the accord. And this is coming back to, to haunt Russia. What's happening is this summer, we've seen that um, the European Union, as you, as you may have heard, has passed something that they call um, the EU Green Deal. I don't know if you've heard about this, but it's a, an EU, direct, uh, EU initiative um, so that all the, the member countries of the European Union are pledging and promising to make Europe climate neutral by 2050. And as part of that effort, they are going to institute some pretty stringent carbon taxes on um, imports of um, fossil fuels into the European Union. Now, 
you know, one of the huge importers of such fuels is, of course, Russia. And so Russia is now starting to worry because there, it, it, this European um, Green Deal and the, le the legislation that goes with it may actually take away or um, add a lot of friction to uh, the market for Russian um, petrochemical, um, oil, natural gas uh, resources coming into Europe. That's at a governmental level. Um, people I've talked to um, sort of on a personal level, do they care about climate change? Yes, they do. I mean, especially Siberians, because Siberia for the, for the last, um, I don't know, for the last 15 years, I would say, and perhaps Professor Moore can, can offer more perspective, Ru Siberia has been on fire every summer. It's been really, really bad. So what's happening in the, on the West Coast right now is something that is an annual event in the Siberian hinterland. And we've witnessed it ourselves. We've had to breathe that air ourselves and it is not pleasant. So people are very concerned. Whether they can get their government to take steps, that's a, another question. Thank you, Tom. Here's a question for anyone who wants to take it. Um, this is from Niraja, our student. Not sure if this has been answered yet, came in late, but I saw that this morning Alexei Navalny posted to his Instagram basically saying he's still there. Um, what does the whole Navalny incident say about the state of the Russian opposition today? So anyone who wants to take that one, you can just jump right in. Okay, Nina. You have to unmute Nina. Uh, Christiana, would you like to address it since I've already spoken on him right now or? Sure, I'm, I think I'll say that uh, I'm, I think that there's been sort of a lot of back and forth recently about how well he's doing. And so as I look at the different accounts, I was wondering, I, I didn't see that he had come out and posted on Instagram today, but um, I think I'll second what Professor Tamarkin said earlier that while Navalny is sort of the best and most salient representative of the so-called opposition, that he doesn't have um, any sort of, he can't, he can't be considered to represent sort of a cohesive opposition that is any credible threat to the Kremlin. Um, but I do, I do think that there are I, I know that Professor Tamarkin, Tamarkin said that there was sort of a very small number of the liber intelligentsia and my sort of um, snapshot research in my studies in the Baltic uh, countries recently was that I would meet a lot of younger people, uh, younger Russians who were still emigrating to the Baltics um, saying that they were just dis, uh, disillusioned with the Russian uh, government and the lack of responsiveness to people's uh, people's demands and desire for a more uh, democratic state. And so I wonder if that those numbers are increasing. And, and as I see the appeals in the, the reform package, the appeals to what I see as likely an older generation and the, the last generation of the Soviet era, I wonder what about that huge number of younger people and their, what, what do they think about um, what do they think about Putin and do they, do they sort of, do they, are they alienated and passive or are they going to find, uh, is there going to be a leader around whom they can sort of uh, rally? And I know that the institutions are against that. So it would be very difficult to form a party that's not already approved by the Kremlin because of the laws. But I wonder if there's any, um, I feel like the demand might be there. Uh, although the civic, the inclination towards civic activism may not be. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, the demand might be there, but there's such a strong feeling on the part of Russians, maybe young people less so, that um, that what that that anything in the future, if you have anybody else, is probably going to be worse. Mm. So at least there's you know there's stability. You know what you're dealing with. I mean, they are a catastrophizing people, um, I think, for, for good reason. So um, I, I just don't see, you know, that, that, that there's any real future for, um, 
for the for Navalny. But I mean, he has played a really important role. Um, I think he might be responsible for some of the lower ratings that Putin has been getting, and uh, that certainly Medvedev. I mean, he had a fantastic video that my students saw exposing um, the personal corruption of uh, Prime Minister Medvedev. Um, so, uh, it, I mean, he's, he is influential in the sense of undermining uh, the popularity of the, the way the Kremlin's working right now. Uh, but I wouldn't put my hopes on some of put him as a kind of alternative. But who knows? I'm an historian. I don't have to predict things. You're a political scientist. You have to predict things. Yeah, well, uh, I'll reiterate that I, I don't see a very rosy future for, uh, for opposition in Russia in, in, the, in, in the absence of some other horrible economic catastrophe. So that, that's sort of my two cents, although I, I try not to make predictions, even though I'm, I'm a political scientist. Yeah. <laughs> well, Christiana, since you're prognosticating right now, um, here's another question for you. Thank you for taking the questions. I'd like to ask all the panelists, if Putin does not step aside in 2024 and serves as the nation's leader until his passing, is there a clear successor for Russia? Do you think this will throw the country into political and or economic instability? Why don't we start with you, Christiana? Well, I don't think there that we can um, think about um, a successor at this point for 2036. Uh, and as far, uh, actually, I had I had asked a question through the chat um, to Professor Tamarkin about um, sort of what about this governor, and it seems to me that I, I don't know very much about the Khabarovsk case, uh, but I, it seems to me that anyone who is even remotely um, who is even remotely popular in Russia, who could be a contender as opposed to sort of a chosen successor, gets eliminated, either murdered or poisoned or or imprisoned or something. Um, but uh, I think that probably Putin cycles through people uh, quickly enough, I, I would guess, that by 2036, we might not see the person who, um, who would be his chosen successor. Certainly, Yeltsin chose Putin at the last minute, if that's a precedent that, we, that might be followed. Well, on that note, we we have run out of questions. Um, I'd like once again to thank our three panelists, to thank all of our um, participants, attendees, and a special thanks to Katie Sengo Jackson. Thank you, Katie, for handling the technical side of this. I really appreciate that. So, uh, with that, we'll wrap up.